Alright, I'm here to introduce you HDMX. This is unironically the intro that I have chosen, which is this beautiful, beautiful post by HDMX, or actually just the banner, which uh, he tends to take pictures of things people positively say on Reddit and then make them his banner. So this one says, the creator of HTMX is a blowhard who found fertile ground for his broken library in the minds of backend devs that refuse to learn JavaScript for reasons that are 20 years out of date. It's propaganda being spread by propagandists. Ignore them all and they'll go away. I am a propagandist being paid by big HTML money. Very excited about this. Uh, it's, I don't know what it is about the world of HTMX, but for whatever reason, it has just the bizarrest either lovers or haters of it. There is just zero middle ground for this library. Uh, I recently saw a tweet saying, uh, someone says that they're very convinced that there's influencer money behind HTMX. I don't know what that means yet. I would love to know more about this influencer money. If anyone would like to send me some, please. Uh, Twitch primes are always accepted around here. All right, so there you go. This is this beautiful thing. And yes, this was literally my introduction. You're welcome. But hypermedia has been around for a long time. There's been papers, engineering exercises long before the internet had uh, such a wide pipe that, I mean, even in 1995, there was discussions and white papers about how to use this as an engine of application state. So this is a fairly older and more researched topic. It's not just some new library that recently came out. It's been going on now for dang near 30 years. So. Hopefully everyone's kind of excited about that. All right, so there is more to HTMX than just the memes. Uh, yes, they use their Twitter quite a bit to deliver all the sweet memes, but really it's just so people can learn about HTMX. It's a great marketing strategy. You would think that it's a whole team of people doing something, spreading the word since it's going all over the place. And yes, it's now on front end masters, but no, it's just one slightly unhinged man in Montana tweeting from his professorship. Nobody knows what's happening. Uh, and it's actually is used in production. There is a nice, beautiful talk about somebody, how they went from React to HTMX, reduced a huge number of their libraries, how fast they're able to build the project. There's a list of sites that use it. I have people that have reached out to me that have converted their big projects from spas into HTMX, several of them with lots of lots of engineers, and they found that they are now moving faster, it's easier to reason about. And I do think that there's not like every single application should be written in HTMX, and I think there's actually a good deal of applications that probably are easier or harder with client-side state management, I just really don't know. But I do think that there is a sweet spot for HTMX, and so at the end of this course, I will try to give you what I think is the good place, what's the bad place, and hopefully you can do that too. So why do I like HTMX? Well, it's kind of a long story, but in about 2009, uh, that movie, the social, uh, the social media one, what's it called? Does anyone remember what it's called? The Social Awkward. The Social Awkward, yeah, that's what it's called. Uh, where Mark Zuckerberg discovers Facebook and that he discovers people really like to know who's dating who, and that's like the point of the story, and it blows up, and all these things happen. And I remember watching that show and getting so pumped up to uh, create my own website and all that. Even though I was in college and all that, I was like, you know, gee dang it, we're gonna do this. And so that's what I did. I sat down, and for 80 hours a week, I tried to learn how to make websites for, oh gosh, four years straight, something like that. And it was fantastic, made websites, tried to do all these things, lost all my money, lived in a uh, small studio apartment where the man below me smoked meth and threatened to kill me and my beautiful wife. So we eventually moved out of there. Fantastic times. But that was like the introduction into the web programming world that I had. And through that, I got to see a whole bunch of change, right? I started before jQuery was super popular. And then during the height of jQuery, where you'd even do your math via jQuery, you know, that whole, you know, jQuery dollar sign three dot add, you know, four. It was really, really beautiful. Uh, those are the good days. And so that was like the height of it. You could see all these Stack Overflow questions that every last one was answered with jQuery, no matter what it was. Fantastic. And then React came out. And at that point, I was working at Netflix, by the way, I work at Netflix. And during that time, I remember thinking, this is the coolest thing ever because I've been using jQuery and all this stuff to manage my website for so long. And now there's like something that 
feels better, it feels more exciting, and I just, I couldn't believe how cool it was. And so we started doing that, and even at Netflix, we started adopting it, even for television platform, and it took us a long time. And during that process, it went from classes are the best to classes are the worst. We had functional component, use effect, don't use effect, and just kept on changing and kept on happening. And over the course of the eight years, and in there, I tried to solve a lot of the data fetching problems that people run into with spas, and they're rerunning into and rediscovering the glories of the N plus one query problem in RSCs right now. And so it's just like you watch all these things happen, and you realize that maybe something went wrong along the way. Maybe things weren't exactly what I thought they were, and I started becoming disenfranchised about six years ago, and I just became progressively more, and I've just been looking around trying to find something that is maybe less foot gunning, something that less causes uh, so many easy problems. And uh, yeah, there'll always be the website that needs these high powered engines, but for the most part, for all of us that are just making our nice little reel of cat photos on the internet, you just don't need necessarily the largest, uh, the largest possible state. I think of the, uh, I don't know if you guys watched the One Piece live action, but uh, when the, the greatest swordsman fight ever happens and he pulls out the little teeny tiny sword, you know, the answer was you just don't, you know, you don't hunt fish with a cannon. And it's just like, yeah, sometimes you just got to get the little sword out. You don't have to have the big one. And so I just absolutely love that part. And so that's kind of HTMX. That's kind of why I love it is that it kind of fit this weird place that I've been looking for, which is I just need something that I can reason about in a more engineering sense about how something moves over time. Because that's ultimately what I'd like. Uh, HTMX is extremely Googleable. If you happen to know what you're looking for, like if you know the terms, it's extremely Googleable. Like, let me, I'll show you. Like, if I go like this, HTMX select, it's gonna come up as one of the first things of how you do uh, things. So, HTMX select. And it's gonna give you all the notes for it. It's very, very easy to learn how to use this. Everything is extremely look upable. Uh, and I helped build uh, the LSP, which is pretty nice. It really only works with NeoVim right now. I'm sure someone, they, I know it kind of has a VS Code integration. It's not on Mason or anything, but. It's all kind of there. It's pretty nice. Um, there's a great book. The book is really great. It's free digitally, so go use it. You can also get um, HTMX coffee mugs that exclaim that you are a HTMX shill. Very good with influencer money. So fantastic stuff out there. You're gonna need to install Golang. 1.2 or higher, preferably, or 1.21 or higher. Uh, you can Google install Golang. It's pretty straightforward. And you should really also install Air. Air is really easy. Just copy and paste this line right here and it will just make things work out very, very easily. Also, make sure you have the Go LSP. Again, life is just easier if you have an LSP. I don't know how VS Code does LSP, so if you're using VS Code, I'm sure it will just tell you how to install it. But if you're using Vim, make sure you get Go, please. And then I have just like a little quick set of things you're gonna want to execute to uh, just get everything up and running. If you're completely unfamiliar with Go, I'm gonna move faster than completely unfamiliar but you can most certainly read the code very easy and all the code will be on the internet. I'm not sure if I've pushed it up or not. I could get it pushed up pretty quickly. Uh, it's pretty straightforward language. Go is an easily, if you have any experience coding, you can pretty much read the language off the rip. It is about as simple as a, of a language as one can get. And it's, a, it's the reason why I chose it for this workshop. I really wanted to use Rust or OCaml, but it's just way harder to convince a group of people to follow along when you're using not the simplest C-based language possible. Okay, everybody, if you can clone down this project, I give you uh, give us just like a little bit of a base template that has a couple things in it, including just the air script, which really, that's just, it makes life pretty easy. Um, all right, awesome. So everyone's there. I'm actually also, I probably need to also do that, so I'm just gonna do that, do the exact same thing. Fantastic. Sometimes um, you're gonna, oh, hey, hey, hey. It didn't go through, did I not? Well, oh, whatever, go, uh, there we go, fantastic. And we can even go mod tidy if you need to. Uh, it's kind of nice to, do, oh, look at that, it already has uh, some things already installed for me. I'm, I shouldn't have anything installed for me, whatever. That's fine enough, I shouldn't be installing any things. Uh, quick notes, I, uh, we're gonna be going through this pretty quick. Um, I've added some intentional failure cases so we can kind of debug what's happening and kind of discover how HTMX works. Uh, there are some intentional moments where you're supposed to feel confused or you're supposed to not like what's happening. I want you actively engaged. Please take the time to guess why things are not working. Please open up the Chrome debugger if you can keep up. It would be very, very good. And I may mess up and accidentally program the right thing. 
And if that happens, I'm sorry, we can back it up and I can try to program the wrong thing to begin with. But if we do it on, if we do, if we do it good, I'm sorry. That's just part of it. And of course, you will forget, you'll forget everything uh, that you've learned up until now to be able to be successful with HTMX. If you try to build an HTMX application like you'd build a React application, you'll be upset. Just like if you try to build a React application with HTMX knowledge, you will be upset. Use any tool the wrong way and it becomes a mess pretty quickly. So we will be using URLs today. I know, they will be used, they will be important. We may even add query parameters to change behavior. We will even be using status codes. This will not be happening today. Okay, this is not an option. There will be no 200s with a 400 inside of the uh, body. This is just not a thing. I know this will be difficult. Uh, some of you may get a little scared, I'm sorry. We'll be even using HTTP verbs, get, post, and delete. We're not doing any updates, but they're not too hard. You get that once, if you know how to do a delete, you know how to do an update. Uh, we'll use as little dependencies as possible. Uh, that's actually why I chose Go, is that I also don't have to tell you 900 things to go and install as far as libraries. We'll be using Go templating, so they're just it's just its already internal item. We'll be using, uh, the only real dependency we'll have is just the server, which we'll be using Echo, which appears to be the simplest possible server I can find. And that's it. So I wanted this course to be about HTMX, not about other texts. It's really not even about Go. It just happens to use Go. All right, uh, time to build the server. So uh, if you're adept at how to launch a server and you want to use a different language than Go, you can follow along and not use Go because the server will not be a huge part of the code today. Oh, actually, I mean, it will be about half the code today. Uh, the other half will be literally HTML. Uh, all I need is that your server should be able to produce HTML. You should be able to respond with various status codes. Uh, you should be able to make routes with params, i.e. like contacts with ID. You should be able to read query parameters, form parameters, uh, anything like that. And you should be able to create verb-based routes, get, post, delete. So as long as you can do that and you feel like you can keep up, then use that. That's one of the beauties of HTMX is that you don't have any requirements on the server. Choose whatever language you want, whatever you're most comfortable with. It has absolutely no decisions or thoughts about what a server should do. And I think that that is very, very important part of HTMX. Uh, there you go. Uh, so where do we start? Well, I think the best place to start is usually the beginning. So we're gonna create a very simple HTTP server uh, and an index page and then upgrade it to use HTMX to give like the very first kind of int introduction. I know in today's world, Templates are not sexy. No one says, hey, everybody, let's use templates. Everyone wants that JSX, that RSX, that GSX, that's Go's version of JSX, which does actually exist. Uh, they are simple, they can become annoying, and I fully agree, templates sometimes are annoying. But so are other options, every option has its trade-off. I intentionally chose templates because of the same reason above. I want zero dependencies and I want this as simple as possible. Anyone with any reasonable amount of programming experience can look at a template and pretty much figure out what's happening, and that's that. So, uh, let's see, which also means I'm gonna try to do uh, everything as grug brain as possible. I'm gonna just have everything in one file for the templates and one file for the server. We're not trying to do good programming here. But if I were to use something and I wanted something a little bit more spicy, I would consider using something like Temple. Temple is pretty cool, and it's an impossible word to uh, Google for. So you try to go Google Golang Temple, you'll probably not get the results that you're looking for. It's quite surprising. So if you ever get interested in it, it's just literally temple.guide. And then you get this whole great little thing about how to build it. So you get to use something that looks like JSX. You can only use string inter uh, interpolation, all that fun stuff. It's actually pretty good. I had a great time uh, playing around with it. All right, uh, now back to our regular scheduled programming. And that's gonna be, and so our task is to display a count that represents how many times a page has been requested. So let's first start with the view, the, uh, the, the delicious HTML. So I'm gonna jump in here, I'm gonna open it up at the base and I'm gonna go down to views. Don't worry about what's in blocks, we'll come there later, okay? And I'm just gonna create a new file called index.html. I'm sure everyone can join in. Now, me personally, I love naming every one of the blocks in a file. I don't know what it is about it, but I like having names for my templates. So I'm gonna go block index, this, and there we go, I've named my block, perfect. And so I'm gonna create a quick HTML5 document, pretty straightforward, and all we're gonna do is just put a count in there. So that should be as simple as count, uh, count. Now if you're unfamiliar with Go uh, templating, these little two 
uh, squirrely braces on each side, simply say, hey, what's in here? I think it's actually Lisp that gets executed in there, so practically OCaml. Uh, but what's inside of here, simply I'm saying, hey, whatever object's passed in, give me the property count off of it. All right, so now we need to set up the server. Uh, you need to definitely get these two items installed. This is just Echo. Uh, it's just a really simple server as far as I can tell. I think they have a decent amount of features. If during your time you're using Echo and you keep seeing an error popping up on your import despite you doing a go get of that item, just execute a go mod tidy. It cleans things up. I'm not really sure what a Go Mod Tidy does other than it must organize your files, make sure you're using all the things that you said you're using and then ensures that they're installed. That's my guess on what it does. And I'm sure the gophers can uh, validate and or tell me I'm wrong, but that's pretty much what I guess happens. All right, so we're gonna come back here. Okay, so I'm gonna execute those two things. Go get GitHub Lab, Echo Lab V4 and go get Echo Lab V4 middleware. It's gonna probably do those two things. I think I already technically accidentally have them already installed. Fantastic. We're gonna go to the command directory. Uh, I'm gonna open this up and just create a main.go. So you can see right here, touch command main.go. Awesome. Create a little quick package main, a quick func main. Awesome. And I'm just gonna start using it as if echo is here. So echo, echo, open up a new echo. Make sure it's v4. As you can see, I'm using v4. Don't accidentally use something else. There we go, new, uh, let's see, we're gonna use a middleware. Look at that, Copilot already knows exactly what we want to do. Add the middleware here. So look at this, I am having that same problem that I was talking about, how it's just like, I don't know what this is. I don't believe any of this stuff exists. So I'm gonna do a little go mod tidy. Everything should be nice there. All right, fantastic. And uh, usually that goes away, there we go. Fantastic. And I'm not using the correct middleware. Oh, look at that, see, V4. There we go. So everything's going good now. Now this is the only part of the course that has a whole bunch of programming that's not really about programming the problem, it's about setting up a project. So if you've never used templates or Echo, you can set it up such that Echo can take in a template renderer and it just makes programming down the road a touch easier. So I'm gonna do a couple things. First, I'm gonna create a quick struct called uh, templates, why not? And it's gonna be pretty easy. I'm gonna call it, there we go. Copilot pretty much auto-completes it all for you. Make sure you get the HTML template. Uh, there we go. I am going to add, look at this, it's already, it, it, Copilot already knows. That's, that's the one, that's the one I want right there. You wanna create this function called render that is based off the templates and it will simply have an IO writer. Uh, it's gonna have a name. It's gonna have the data for the, uh, for the template and it's gonna have the context from Echo. It returns an error. Pretty much how Echo works is just that it has functions that return errors, usually takes in a context, return out an error. That's pretty standard. And I'm just gonna execute the template, and that means I'm gonna write to the writer uh, whatever's in the template and pass in the data and everything. So it kind of takes care of all this stuff for you. And then I also usually like to do like a new templates. I don't know why I like to do this kind of stuff, and Copilot's usually really good at uh, auto-completing it. Just create a new template that ensures that we are able to parse out the HTML. All of our HTML is in the views folder. So I have it in the views folder, there we go. So if you're familiar with a different way to produce views and to use a different server, again, you can even use a different server and go, I don't really care, long as you can just do your basic verb routing and everything. So I think we have everything we need at this point to produce uh, a delicious route. So I'm gonna go down here. Here, I'll leave this up for one more moment. Let everyone try to catch up. If you're using Copilot, it, it should, if you have Echo imported, and you just start typing templates, pretty much everything will be auto-completed because this pattern just exists thousands of times on the internet. So it can pretty much recognize it right off the rip. We hope you're enjoying the course. By the way, a Front End Masters membership gives you access to hundreds of courses just like this. Our practical, real-world courses are taught by experts working on large-scale applications at companies like Netflix, Stripe, Google, and more. Grab a membership today and gain the confidence and the skills you need to get to the next stage of your career. Awesome. All right, so now all we're gonna do is I'm gonna set up a, a renderer. So I'm just gonna say, hey, render, here's a new template. So all a renderer needs to be is has a render function with that same arguments that I said above, a writer, a name, data, and uh, the context. Boom, so now we can start using that render really easily within the go routes uh, going off the context. All right, so we're gonna do an e.get, 
and I am going to uh, pass in a function that takes a echo context, returns an error, pretty much everything that I said, and now we just simply need to render out the index.html. Now, if you remember, uh, you may not remember, but our we expect an object that has a dot count property on it, and we're going to render that property. So I'm going to jump back here, and we need to create that struct. So I'm going to go type count struct that has a count int, fantastic, and then I'm going to create a count equals count count zero. I think that's how you do these specifications. There we go. Too many languages bounced around in my head. So every single time count or uh, slash is requested, I'm going to increment the count, and then I'm going to render the index uh, template. Remember, I named all my blocks, so this is the index block. I'm just going to render it out. There we go. I want a 200. I want the name template, and here's the object I want to use for that template. Fantastic. That's why we did all that work up, up above, make this part kind of easy right here. So everyone should be able to follow along. At the end of the day, this is the code we had to write. Fantastic. And if we've done everything correctly, which we have one more item, which look at that, Copilot just knows. It just knows we have to do this e logger fatal. We have to actually listen now. So I'll go on port 42069, and we'll go over here and do a little local host 42069. You'll start it, site can't be reached. Why can't it be reached? You didn't actually start the program. You gotta start the program, okay? It's that simple. So in a second terminal, just type in air. Air has all the configuration for this project to just uh, watch. So if we change any files, including HTML files, it will automatically recompile our server. It's super fast, makes it really easy. You probably won't be able to get to the browser in time from your editor before Go has already reloaded. Goes super fast. It'll make this pretty easy. So when I refresh, it's count one, it's count two, it's count three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, all the way up to whatever number we want. There's all of our logs because we use the logger, so we may need to use this for debugging at some point this, uh, during this course. There we go. Fantastic. Okay, so we've done it. We have built step one, which is the counter. That uh, command was just air? Air, yeah, A-I-R. So once you did that go install uh, air, it will make it publicly available. You may need to do a hash dash R, or you may need to make sure that wherever the go bin uh, path is, is within your path. So if you don't have air, air is effectively node mod. Yeah, that's a fair way to put it. Air is kind of, or maybe it's a little bit better to say air is more like, uh, like Webpack dev serve. It's, having everything, it's watching everything. The moment you make a change, it's redoing. It's the Vite of Go. Uh, in case I forgot how to program, here's all the things. Look, that's pretty much, I pretty much program the exact same thing each time. All right, fantastic. So we're gonna change from HTML, which is what we're doing right now, and we're gonna change into HTMX, okay? So we're gonna do three things. We're gonna add an endpoint, post, uh, slash count, that increments the value that's gonna be appearing on the index page. We're gonna remove the incrementing from the get route, and we're gonna add a button to the HTML that goes and makes things happen. All right, sounds good. Uh, by the way, this will be a great point. If you use Copilot, you can kind of cheat some of the, some of the things right here, uh, but if you don't, that's fine. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a post endpoint. Should be pretty straightforward, so I'm gonna do that post count, and this will do the counting, and then I'll return out the template. The get, we no longer increment on a get, only on a post to count. So pretty simple server change. Uh, not a lot just went on there. And then we're gonna go over to our templates and we need to add a little something. So I'm gonna add a button and that's gonna do something called hx, uh, it's gonna do hx get or a post. So this means I'm gonna make a post request with this button and it's gonna be for slash count and there we go. So now we have a button on the page called count. I have told it to post to count. Don't worry, we're gonna explain all this in detail. This is just kind of like the high level introduction. We're gonna post it to count and we should see just what happens. So I pretty much did everything that needs to happen except for we also need HTMX in our website. HTMX is a small JavaScript library. So I'll go like this. I'm gonna tell Copilot, please get me HTMX CDN. This is one of the fun parts about Copilot, and bam, it worked. But if you don't have Copilot, go to htmx.org, go to the docs, search up the word script, enter through a few times, and right there, it's about the fourth one in via the CDN link. We're just gonna use the CDN link. It's easy, it's straightforward to use. We don't need a build process. Awesome, we have that. 
we now have the HTMX script and we have uh, the HTMX post going on. All right, so a lot of you are probably confused. Again, that's okay. I want you to try to start drawing boxes in your head at this point. So if we've done everything correctly, when I refresh this, we get a count button. You should also see that. Let's press count. It's probably not what you wanted to see. This is probably not the results you were hoping for. It kind of sucks. Look at that. I mean, this is this is that's just not this is this is not good at all, is this? I can't get my air to run. Can't get air to run? If you can't get air to run, you can I mean literally you could I mean this would be super annoying, but you can you can just go go run command uh, main.go. And that will run the server. It's just that when you make a change, you're just gonna have to run it yourself, which is it's just annoying more than anything else. Air was just supposed to be a convenience so you don't forget to refresh your server and then you'll be debugging why isn't this thing and then you'll go, oh yeah, I forgot to update it. Just like the classic why file watching is just such a good developer experience. I cannot tell you how many hours of my life has been devoted to I forgot to restart the server. At least, I would honestly say at least one solid year of my life has been devoted to that just singular bug. All right. Fantastic. So hopefully everyone is on board. Um, so we did these code updates. Yep, everyone sh everyone should be able to see these updates. Pretty straightforward. Oh, I did more count right there. And now what happened? I don't think anyone likes the results. I think it's probably time that I introduce HTMX in maybe a more structured way because this this probably isn't what everyone was going for. This double button. Somehow my button had a baby here, and everything feels confused. So first thing is. Hadios. You've probably seen this term, heard this term. It stands for hyper, hypermedia as the engine of application state, meaning the state of your HTML is the state of your program, and that is how we drive the changes uh, further on down the line is what is currently there. In the modern world, we don't do that. What we do in the modern world is that we have the virtual DOM usually contains the state of your program. Then you have a secondary state, which is all the closures and things within your JavaScript the use state, all the little bits that are going to update that virtual DOM, that's your second layer of state. Then typically, if you're more enterprise you'll have a third layer state, which is your Redux state, which is controlling your routes. It could be controlling how you're getting data, async reducers, selectors, all that fun stuff to just simply drive the engine of state. And so in the HTMX world, we try to make it simple. The hypermedia, the HTML, that's the engine of uh, the engine of application state, not all the other things, all the other layers. It's your server is the truth, your client is the reflection of the truth, and there's little in between. Now you can go as much as you want. I've seen projects where they use HTMX for all the Chrome and all the stuff around the application, and then they use React inside of it to drive all the user interactions. Totally reasonable, you can emit events from within a React application and have HTMX actually run on the outside and do all the updating and executing on the outside. So totally okay. Uh, does that mean HTML is finally a programming language? Yes. Does that mean you're finally an HTML engineer? Absolutely. What a great day to be alive. Finally. Uh, also, uh, this is a 2011 uh, little, nice little document which you should read. This is by the current community manager of Rust, and he uh, has a whole talk about how to do Hadios and all this stuff, even in 2011. So this is a fairly again. This concept's been around for quite some time. This is not something new. It just feels new because some unhinged Montana man has now made it popular. And that, by the way, I'm not the unhinged Montana man. Uh, all right, so let's do this. Hopefully, uh, I have the exact link. Oh, yes, I do. Oh, fantastic. So typically, this is kind of like your standard server interaction. I do a get at the root, and the server responds with some HTML some, that has links off to JavaScript. Maybe it's not a server that actually does it. Maybe it's like a CDN in front of the server. Whatever, whatever happens, something happens and you get HTML back, right? And so typically we're gonna be doing something like this with, with uh, HTMX. Any element may have some sort of hx-verb. That verb will have a path. We will make a verb request to that path. It will hit the server. The server's expectation is to respond with HTML. The contents of the HTML will replace the inner HTML of the element that made or that initiated the request. And that is only if it responds with the 200. So if you respond with the 400, a 500, or whatever, you now have to define some sort of custom behavior. HTMX just says, no, we're not going to do anything in the four to 500s. So 
That means if we had a div that posted to foo and it had the contents of four green squares and the server responds with two blue squares, the final state will look something like this. The div will now have two blue squares. HTMX does emit a lot of events, so you can hook in with JavaScript if you want to add custom behavior. Uh, it can react on a lot of different things, including custom events. It has ways to reduce uh, HTML from the request so you don't actually get the entire request. You can just select out parts you want. And it also has ways to redirect to the HTML to other parts of your application. So this is all a part of it. And you can even redirect from the server or you can redirect from the client. You can make the choice yourself uh, depending on where and how you do it. All right. So pretty fantastic. Hopefully everyone, like that's it. I just taught you pretty much all of HTMX right now. So we're gonna kind of go through some exercises and put this into practice. I just really want you to see this image right here. This is, I think is the best image to understand HTMX. Starts with some green squares inside of it. You make a request, server responds with blue squares. Now you have blue squares inside of that same div. The div was not removed, the insides were removed. All right, so that probably explains what happened here. Right? I think we can start guessing as to why our button has a button inside of it. All right, so before we go on though, let's go over a couple common arguments you will hear against HTMX. Aren't servers supposed to respond with JSON? What if I need a different view? Why would my server ever want to understand the representation of the client? Well, even before I go to part one, uh, your server does understand the representation of your client because it is responding with JSON. It already has some understanding of how you are communicating betwixt the two. You've agreed upon names of keys. You've agreed upon types of values. You've already made a lot of agreements that are implicitly there. Uh, second, you can use accept headers. I accept HTML or I accept JSON. And your server can be the one that has all the smarts to say, oh, this is a request for data in the format of JSON. Here is the JSON view of the same data. Oh. You are requesting uh, HTML. Here's the HTML view for that same data. So don't sleep on headers. Headers have a lot of control. A second and important thing about uh, state, right now the current approach is this. The server knows the state and produces a view uh, into it, JSON being the most popular transfer. The view is then uh, transferred across the turtles after being created into a set of zeros and ones. The client decodes those zeros and ones and turns it into some sort of object or representation it can understand, usually JSON parse. It then reconciles the JavaScript state and then it produces HTML from that reconciliation to be updated somewhere within the application. So that's, I mean, there's a lot of things that can go wrong there. HTMX is more that your server produces a view, HTML. The view is transferred across the turtles via some sort of encoding. Uh, usually strings are already ones and zeros, so it's pretty easy to do. The view is then decoded and turned into HTML and placed according to the rules on the originating element or the server overrides. Uh, I said this is a slight lie, that's because I just mentioned right now, the server can override a couple things. All right, you get that. Isn't producing HTML, or HTML slow? No, it's not, it's not slow. What is slower, crawling an object in which you are discovering all the keys, concatting all the strings, going through every single value and slowly crawling everything, or is just doing string interpolation with rope strings uh, slower or faster? I don't think you're gonna see I, if anything, I think you'll see probably a better performance with HTML than you will with JSON. I can't 100% confirm this. It's just that I don't have, I've never tested everything fully myself. But at the end of the day, producing JSON is not fast. There was an Intel paper in 2012 or 13 that uh, claimed that over 60% of all server time is spent copying data. And that is it. And if you think about what JSON does, it is literally the ultimate copying of data from one format into another format. All right, it seems like uh, HTMX is for backend devs. No serious UI UX engineer would use HTMX, right? I mean, I, I, I made a nice little pretty application with it. I mean, there's no, there is no indication into whether the client is interactive or not interactive with JavaScript. There is no indication into how much styles you do or don't use. It's up to the person who implements it. So can someone use it? Absolutely. Do you have to use it? You don't have to. You can write a web 1.0 styled website if you want to, or you can make it really pretty. Just don't go web three. Once you go web three, you've, you've jumped the shark. Now you have a whole different website you're creating. And so one more time, just in case you forget, uh, if we make this element, HTMX will bind an on-click handler because the default action is a click. Uh, we can override what the action is, but the default is an on-click handler on the div. When the div gets clicked, it sends a get request to some resource. When the server responds, the contents of the div will be swapped out with whatever the server responds with. 
Uh, with HDMX, uh, aren't you going against your own advice making statements about performance without testing? Uh, with the HTML production, that's why I said I don't know. Uh, I just know that adding strings together in a rope data structure is exceedingly cheap. Uh, crawling an object and all of its properties in a dynamic or reflection-based way is expensive. That's just long-standing intuition. Probably plays a pretty good role here. I would still test it though. I would always test it. Never, never just assume you're right on how things are performance-based because almost always you're wrong. Typically, your gut dev or your gut, uh, your gut uh, feel is usually wrong when it comes to performance. Just always test, always measure. Very simple. What Node.js templating engine do you recommend? Um, I am not really a big fan of Node.js for server stuff. If I were to use one, I have no strong feelings. I mean, there's there's plenty of little templating libraries I've played around with. They've all been fun. I've, I've in general, not enjoyed using React-like or JS, should I, I should probably say JSX-styled templating. I tend that I, I, I find that I tend to overcomplicate it with a bunch of logic because I can. Like once you have that available path, I tend to take that available path. And then I find that I'm very upset about uh, JSX. So not it's not a React problem. It's definitely a JSX problem. Yeah, people really like Bun, Elysian, and HTMX and React and Terso, right? The Beth stack, right? That's Bun, Elysian, Terso, and HTMX. People really like that stack. That's by Ethan. Uh, super cool stack. How is HTMX lighter on resources than React? Um, if you look at the only thing, so now we're talking about like dynamic fetching of data and all that stuff. I would love to talk about that. I think Dax, if you know who Dax is, and I will be having a podcast on this. I've spent a lot of time thinking about JavaScript data fetching and how to do it optimally, how to have components to find their own data that they need and to be able to aggregate that into something that can like uh, batch and dedupe requests. Request duplication is very, very difficult to do. We have a full working thing that we used to have at Netflix and we're moving over to uh, GraphQL, uh, but it's a very complicated process and it's 100% not a solved process and I don't think it is actually a solved process. Uh, I would like to talk about that more, but I think that it's gonna be a different thing because that's a whole realm onto itself. Let's debug what happened and then we're gonna fix the issue. So if we go back to here, let's open up the Chrome Dev Tools. Okay, it'll make life easy having these available. Uh, so let's just refresh this and I'm gonna hit the word count. And now let's look at the response of count. Okay, because we can see we made the request. The headers look like we made a post to uh, localhost 4269 slash count. So we have the right path. Uh, we did get a nice response, which is this right here. And if we look at the response HTML, look at what we sent down. We sent down the entire document. Now, HTMX does a little bit of a trick. If it receives an entire document, it will only select out the body content. It will just kind of go, okay, obviously we don't need, you know, you don't need these new headers. You don't need all this stuff. You just need the body content. And so it'll put the body content into the requesting div, which is obvious what happened. If you open up the element and you look at button, you'll notice that button has the exact same stuff that count has right here. So oopsie daisy, we just sent down and we just put it into the button. So let's solve this. It's actually a pretty simple solve. Uh, we need to set a target. So I'm gonna go like this, uh, HX target. So if you don't know what target is, target allows you to uh, specify which element should receive this content after the Ajax request. You can use a CSS selector or a series of um, basic uh, supported JavaScript selectors. Uh, they're from, uh, you can read about them on uh, MDN. So you can do find, next, previous, this, closest, or a CSS selector. So I'm gonna go body. There we go. So just do whatever you're doing, but attach it to the body. So if you're using air, it will automatically recompile. If you're not using air, you're gonna have to execute it yourself. And now, Look at that, it just sits here and it just counts. But I mean, let's be real for a second. Is that great? Do we want to always be responding and replacing the body? Is that just how you want to live your life? The answer, I've seen head shakes all over the place. Uh, absolutely, so let's try to boil this down just a touch more. How does that sound? Let's make it a little bit better. All right, so I'm gonna jump back over to, well, first off, you'll notice also the HTML is correct. So. Good thing to always double check. All right, HTML is correct. So let's go over here and I'm gonna create a new block. Block, uh, we'll call this thing uh, count. 
And I'm gonna go up here and I'm just gonna take out the body and I'm gonna just post it in here. And then I'm gonna go back up and I'm gonna go template count. So there we go. So I'm gonna just say, hey, we want this small little bit. I don't need to send down the entire response. I'm just gonna send down the things that I think are worthy of change. Feels pretty good, right? I'll let everyone take a moment. I'm sure you guys can program these templates pretty easily. Uh, they're fairly well understood. I don't think, I assume no one has a question about what this means, but in case you do, render template named count and pass in the object that was passed to me. Pretty straightforward, right? All right, this block says I'm block count and I, I accept an object and I will now use that object right here. Okay, everyone gets it pretty straightforward. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. So now that we have that, let's jump back over to our code and in our post, instead of rendering the index, let's render just that count. So I'm gonna take the count, I'm gonna replace index with count. So there we go, fantastic. So now if I were to run the server, let's just refresh everything so we can see it's all uh, into its original state. When I press this, we still get this beautiful updating, but it is the entire body, not as cool. But notice that the response now is just this little bit. Better, yes. Best, no. We can all agree this is not best, it's just simply better. So we should probably try to make it even better, okay? So I'm gonna go back here. Let's just make sure this is what I wanted to do. Okay, yeah, I did wanna do it here. All right, so let's try rendering something slightly different. Let's change how we do this so-called HTML. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna take the button out of here. I'm gonna put it right here. And then I'm gonna add a div and call ID, uh, how about this one, count, right? Fantastic. And instead of targeting the body, let's target count. So I'm just gonna use a CSS selector again to just simply say, hey, when you press this button, make a post request, but I want you to target the div count for the replacement. And now my count template literally looks like this. It's, it's like nothing, right? It's absolutely nothing, but we're still gonna refer to it, which means that when I go to the server, I'm still only rendering that, but when I go to the client, I'm only gonna be replacing this small amount of text. So it is now as minimally defined as possible. Second thing I'd like to highlight right here is the entirety of the behavior of this is within shot of four lines of code. So often they refer to this as locality of behavior. You can kind of understand what's happening in its entirety by just looking at a few lines of very declarative code. So HTMX tends to be a very declarative driver of your application. Now there are some imperative procedural parts of HTMX, but for the most part, it's very declarative style. Uh, so now when we go back here, uh, we'll now press count and we'll still increment when we look at our element, you'll notice that it beautifully just counts right there. We're no longer replacing body. And when you look at the network, we're just replacing it with the string five. Now we could even make it smaller. We could even just make it so it only transfers down just that singular byte. But I hate to let you people down. If you're transferring less than 1500 bytes, it's all the same, right? There's only, you know, that's called the TCP packet. That's the MTU, the minimum or the maximum transmission unit. So whether you're transferring one byte or 1499, it's pretty much all the same. So you're not making any more Ws at this point. So now that we did that, absolutely fantastic. Hopefully everyone kind of kept up with that idea. You can kind of see how we started targeting HTMX to make updates within the application. This is great, but it's not really great because I can just feel that everybody here wants to see interactivity. Right now we're just seeing basic replacement. Yeah, that was awesome. Way easier to use than just Ajax and trying to find HTML elements yourself but it's not any different at this point. So I want to win, I want a big win. So now remember, uh, this is also a goal to learn HTMX. So will I be programming with the world's greatest technique today? Absolutely not. Will we do things, maybe some corners will be cut today? Absolutely fine. But our goal is to learn HTMX, it's not to be good at programming today. What, no tailwind? What is the, what, Twitter is in shambles right now. Yes, we will not be using Tailwind because I'm gonna spend approximately zero seconds thinking about how this thing looks. I just want to show you 
how we can execute things, how we can add interactivity, how we can do some hooking in with JavaScript. And I'm only gonna show just the surface of it, but as long as you can understand that, okay? Uh, you can literally, not figuratively, but actually literally use React with HTMX. You can use web components, lit components, whatever you want. You can even raw dog some JS and CSS in there if you need to. We will probably be opting into the final strategy today because it is the most straightforward to see how it's done the classic tailwind problem. So we're gonna build a small contacts application. The application has a form that takes in a name and an email and saves it. Uh, so the first thing we want to do is create this email form or this form that takes in name and email. Uh, every time we hit save, it will add the name and email to the server just in memory and display the updated list of names and email. Now you're probably asking no squeal light. Are you serious? You're not even doing that? Don't you love Terso? Uh, isn't this like a hashtag sponsored moment? We could just have this totally work out. No, I don't want to do it. Again, this is just trying to be as minimally uh, viable product as possible because I really don't want to get bogged up on anything. So yes, every time we make a change to our server, do we lose our data? Absolutely. Um, so first, let's do the HTML part of the server, which should be pretty easy. We're going to build a form uh, with name and email and a submit button, and then we got to build a display that is a list of names and emails and contacts. Should be pretty straightforward. I think everyone here should be able to do this quite easily, but if you can't, follow along. So we're gonna keep index, but we're gonna probably need to get rid of all this. Get out of here, we don't need that. We don't need block account. Let's start by building the form. I'm gonna call this block form for form. Yes, is that a good name? No, it's not. Is it a good name for our application? Absolutely, probably should have called it create contact, but we didn't. Now this is we're gonna we're gonna make uh, I'm not even gonna use that we're gonna use a pretty uh, poor form of HTML here I'm gonna go name and this will be an input with let's see let's see if Copilot can guess we got type text name is name values this fantastic I'm gonna remove most of this we don't actually need any of this all right awesome so I'm just gonna have a very simple uh, input which is name I'm gonna take name we're gonna take name and we're gonna replace it with email uh, oh that's not what we wanted. So there we go, pretty straightforward. And I'm gonna make this type email. We're gonna use some HTML5 validation in here. Did you know that input types can have validation full freezy? Yes, you can. Now you could drive this all by the server. You could drive it by client side stuff if you really wanted to. Right now, we're just gonna drive it via HTML5 validation and what the server says. We could get rid of this to make life easier if I wanted to. Uh, do we wanna make it easier? We could just make it easier, but Oh, uh, let's just make it easier because honestly, it's just nicer to type. I don't want to have to think about things. It just makes life easier. So there we go. Uh, fantastic. Next, I'm going to create a block display, which again, poorly named, but it gets the point across. We're going to display the list of contacts. All right. So this is where we're going to just display all the things we have in the server. I'm going to do the following. Let's go a, a div on the outside, nothing like a good bowl of div soup. And then I'm going to do a range over contacts, whoops, fantastic. And now I'm just gonna display each contact and look at that, it already did it for me, absolutely awesome. I'll go name, email, this is pretty straightforward. So if you don't know about ranges in Go templates, it's pretty straightforward. If you could just go range.contacts, it's, I don't like this style, it really bothers me, but it, it just works out for this. It implicitly changes the this object or the dot to be referring to whatever we're ranging over, not the outer thing that was passed into the block. So can this be annoying? Absolutely. Do I love it? Absolutely not. But for the sake of our simple program, this templating language is more than enough for us to get pretty dang far. And honestly, you can get really far in Go's templating language. They have some ways to create variables and all that. We're just not doing that today. We're keeping it simple. And lastly, we're gonna want a little bit of styling on here. I'm gonna go display uh, flex. I know, I'm, look at this, we're actually just doing CSS and flex direction is a column, col column, there we go. Can you believe that I actually just got done doing inline CSS? You probably think I'm a front end engineer at this point. All right, so now, we've, now that we've built a, a, the form in the display, let's make sure we put it into the actual index page. So I'm gonna go up here and we're gonna go template form, template display, put a nice little HR betwixt them. So that way we can kind of see them separated. Pretty straightforward. Do the form, do the display, let's move on. Now, we do have a bit of a problem when we build our server. We need a contact, we need an object with a contacts list. So we're gonna do that here shortly, but let's see what we got to do next. 
All right, so look at this. Here's our fully programmed HTML engineering. How close did I get? Oh man, look at how much more professional I made this one. I did forget this. We do need to tell the form where to post itself to. So I'm gonna jump back here. I'm gonna go to the form and I'm gonna go hx post equals, uh, how about contacts, right? This feels pretty resty of me. So we're gonna post to contacts uh, the name and the email and we also kind of need a button that is a submit. So create contact. Fantastic. So we have a button that submits the form. Forgot a couple items. Awesome. Let's go on. I'm really just not a great HTMLer. My HTML engineering, very poor. Oh, look at that. I, I didn't even do a flex container in this one. Wow. Just rookie material over here. All right. Awesome. So I like everything that I'm saying. Our index.html now requires a object with contacts on it. And we need to create an endpoint slash contacts that uh, is a post endpoint. So let's do those couple things. So I'm gonna jump back here. I'll just use this and we'll go uh, contacts. Awesome. And we render out the, uh, the index here and we have this down here. I'm just gonna, we'll just call this currently index for now until we can figure out what to do with this template. Uh, we'll create this here in just one moment. But before we create it, let's start by creating the contacts item, right? We need something that, well, we need that. So let's first start off with type contact is gonna be a struct and it's gonna have a name that's a string and it's gonna have an email that's a string. And then we want to be able to have a nice little function that's say new contact. I always like that kind of stuff. Uh, plus Copilot can really just make this stuff kind of fly right through. And do we want it as a pointer? Nah, let's just create a nice little contact right here. Very beautiful. And then I also want a type contacts that is going to equal a array of contact. This will make parts of things easier later on, having a nice little typed item right here. Uh, and then we also need some sort of type data that is a struct. All right, this is just the data for the page. I don't care what you call it. Contacts, contacts, fantastic. We're moving, okay? We're just trying to move fast here, people. I'm also gonna have a uh, func new data that's gonna return out a data object. And I wanna make sure I fill it, I wanna precede it with a little bit of data. Because if you don't, that means every time we try to do something, you have to like type multiple times to do all the stuff and it's super annoying and it's just, I, I, I don't wanna do that. So we're gonna have uh, John Doe at gmail.com and then uh, the next one, since I'll call it Clara Doe, because if you do Jane Doe, then the email is like the same and it's just super annoying, so we can't do that. There we go. So now we have our beautiful data that has a contacts, that has a couple preceded contacts in there. Uh, just to go over everything we did, we created a new contact, which is name and email. We have a function to create a new contact, name and email. Uh, but you don't have to put this extra string there. Okay, okay, calm down and let Copilot take control. Okay, let Copilot take the wheel. Uh, next, uh, have a little type alias for contacts. We have a data that uh, just has contacts on there. And then we create a new data with some preceded values. Okay, so hopefully everyone's kind of following along. You should be able to program this all on your own. Even if you're not familiar with Go, I bet you could probably Google slash Copilot your way into an answer here. Not too hard. All right, fantastic. So we don't need count anymore. I'm just gonna call it data. You know why? Because I'm not good at naming things. I've never been good at naming things. I admit that. I admit how bad I am at naming things. So now we have a new data. When we do our get, I'm just gonna pass in data. Because remember, we need something with the dot contacts on it. Fantastic. Now when we do our uh, post to contacts, well, I don't really know what we should be doing here, right? Where should we be putting the data? What kind of data should we pass in? So for now, let's just render out the index because we don't really have a strong plan here. And let's see what happens. Let's see, did I get everything correct? Just wanna make sure. Oh yeah, look at how beautiful. Oh, I used HTMX. <laughs> Rookie mistake right there. Oh yeah, I forgot to actually implement the post. Let's implement the post, probably a good idea, right? So I want name from the form value, I want email from the form value, and then I'm just simply gonna go data.contacts equals append data.contacts, new contacts, name and email, right? Your classic Go code right here, fantastic. And now we're just gonna render this out. So we've added the contact to the end of the list and we're rendering it out. Sounds good? Awesome. Did I get it all correct? All right, so whew, before we uh, display all this, let's jump over here. I'm gonna refresh it. Look at how beautiful this is. We have ourselves this wonderful, modern looking form. And so now I'm just gonna type in a name and an email. Remember, we're putting no validation on email right now. And look at what happens when we create a contact. 
If everyone's followed along mostly correct, you should be seeing something that looks like this. So before I go on, do, does, does, do people need time? Time, time calls? Anybody? You look distraught. You need time? I'm fine. You're fine? You good? Yeah? No? Yeah? Okay, yeah. Yeah, good? Yeah? Okay, yeah. Mark, you, you good? Okay, we got thumbs up everywhere, just making sure. Twitch, you good? Yeah, no, yeah, frontendmasters.com, yeah, no, yeah. All right, everyone says, okay, we got a couple no's in there, but mostly yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, now we're getting a lot of no's in there. I'm sorry. Um, sorry. Fantastic times. So there we go, we have this nice little post. When we make a post, this is what happens to our contacts page. This kind of sucks. Can we all agree that this sucks? This is not, like, that's, this is not what I want to see at all, right? This is not it, this is not it at any of it, in fact. This is horrible. And if I keep on adding, it'll just keep on getting worse and worse and worse and worse and look at that thing go. It's just awful, right? So this isn't beautiful. I bet you though, that a lot of people can now guess what happened. What happened? I have no idea. You have no idea, but we have already solved this problem. We're not targeting the dev. Say it out loud, come on. We're not targeting the dev. We're not target. yeah, we're not targeting the right content. I love it. I know, John, right, John? Yeah. I knew you were gonna get it correct. I could feel it. You were ready. You were just there. Um, all right, so yeah, that's exactly it. Look at our response. We're responding with the whole darn thing, and what is it doing? Who made the request in this situation? The form made the request. So therefore, the form gets replaced. I mean, if we go to the HTML, we might see that our form has a form that has a form that has a form that has a form. Our forms had babies. Look at that. Look at how many it had. So we did something wrong here, right? We need to start targeting and thinking about how are we gonna update this page? And this is actually quite an interesting problem. We're gonna get to the problem of form and display all in one page. Let's see, I don't know where, what it says. Yeah, so let's fix this problem. So this is the same problem as before. We're returning the whole thing. So first and obvious and easiest thing we can do, if you're lazy and you just wanna get a product out there, just hit it with the old HX target equals body. Oh my goodness. Fantastic, I'm refreshing the page. Did you see how fast that compiles? Look at, oh my, oh my goodness. It's just like, it's the easiest thing ever. Look at that, we're just adding stuff, it's updating, not a big deal. Super, super simple. Um, by the way, do you, I just love how fast that, it's just, the, the compilation's just so good. All right, is this good? What are some problems with this approach? Can someone give me a problem with what we're doing right now? John. Are we sending the full HTML? We're, sell, we're sending the whole, we're sending all the contacts and everything. What's the problem? On chat, John says, losing focus if you are targeting the body. You can lose focus, yes. Yeah. So there's all, an entire concern on focus and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you can totally fix all those things. We're not gonna really be talking about that. There's obviously autofocus, HTMX. If a child component has focus, will ensure that focus is retransferred to the same uh, item. There's a whole bunch of stuff around focus. Uh, there's also the whole uh, you know accessibility concern. We're probably not, we're just we're not going to be really focused on that. No pun intended. Uh, instead, we're going to be focusing more on just the HTMX side of things because that really is a JavaScript slash front end problem. It's not really an HTMX problem. Again, it's the same reason why we're not thinking about styling. It's just not a problem of HTMX. The payload get bigger the more trips that happen. Yes, so if you couldn't hear it, the payload keeps getting ever bigger. Meaning if you had a thousand contacts, we have to send down 1,000 contacts plus a form every single time you add one. That's a horrible problem to be in. We don't wanna be there. So we're gonna explore the space just a little bit, okay? We're just gonna get in there. We're gonna see what happens because this seems kind of exciting. Uh, yes, I know some people are suggesting the fix being rust. Thousand contacts, not a big deal with rust, right? Still a problem. Trust me, this is a problem. Let's not do that. Uh, so let's first start by only responding with contacts. That should be a pretty easy reduction of stuff. So let's jump back in here and we need to change two things. We need to change who are we targeting and then the code that's being generated. So I'm gonna go like this, HX target, and let's go down here and call this thing ID equals contacts, right? And then we're gonna jump back here and we're gonna go pound contacts. All right, awesome. So now that we have that, that should do all the redirecting. So now we're gonna go over to the server and we need to say, hey, don't render the index, render the contacts, right? Or wait, I think I call it display. Did I call it display? 
Yeah, I called it display. Terrible name, but you get the idea. Okay, awesome. We, we're gonna do that. So I'm going to refresh this and let's add a contact. Okay, I mean, that's better, right? We're, we're, get, we're, we're getting better. I'm gonna just keep on, look, I'm just creating so many sweet contacts. Is this better? In some sense, it's better, but let's take a little gander at what's happening inside. Look at, look at, what, look at what happened here. We, we're having multiple levels of contacts. Why is that? Can anyone tell me why we're having multiple levels of contacts? Doing inner HTML. Inner HTML, boom. Did you know, HTML, you can say how you want to replace it. So let's just jump up here and let's do a little HX swap equals outer HTML. So instead of replacing the inner contents, let's replace the entire element here for a second. So let's at least fix that problem. So I'm gonna do that, do that, and boom, as we added a bunch, notice that oh, we no longer have that problem. So we can kind of specify how we wish to swap out the elements, which is a pretty cool little item. So for those that didn't see it, on the form I did HX swap. And so this is just how you dynamically say, this is how we want to change things out. Pretty cool, pretty great. Very happy about that. I'm happy, you're happy, hopefully. Let's keep being happy together. All right. So, is that good? What's wrong with this approach again? There's two big things. There's two very glaring problems here. We already kind of discussed the first one. What's the first one? First one's uh, start returning multiple uh, users. Yeah, we're returning way too many users. It could get really bad. What's the second obvious problem with this approach? It doesn't clear out. What, I mean, I just added the, pretty much the same contact over and over again. There is absolutely no error handling at all. What happened if what we put up there and you can always bypass the client, right? So you cannot even think that client, uh, client validation is a real topic to be trusted. You have to do all your validation on the server. So the two big problems is, A, we're sending all the contacts, and B, we have no way to specify how errors are delivered back to the client. Maybe this contact already exists. Maybe you didn't enter in a valid email. We got some problems here. So. Uh, yeah, I already did this. Well, one option is we could use something called response headers. If you don't know what response headers are in HTMX, you can actually do some server side overriding of how things should happen. So I could say, hey, we're gonna retarget our response to the form and deliver down some errors. We could re, uh, we could re-swap. We don't want an outer HTML swap, we want to inner HTML swap. Or however we wish to do it, we could do any sort of re-swapping, retargeting, re-all the things. I don't wanna do that but that is an option if you wish to do that. I find that feels a little bit more confusing for me, feels a little bit harder to kind of grasp what's happening, feels like it could be a little goofy. The other, another option would be out of band updates. So this is pretty cool idea where HTMX, you can actually say, hey, go update this other place as well. So, okay. So let's make the response be an error on duplicate email and displays errors uh, in, the for, uh, in the form. 400 status code for bad request, right? That should, let's use proper status codes. Let's have this really proper experience. I just wanna make sure, okay, awesome. Let's do that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go over here and luckily we were very, very smart earlier. We did a little type alias. So I'm gonna do a little funk, a uh, little, little uh, C uh, contacts. And then we're gonna go we're gonna go uh, uh, has email, why not? This is you know probably not the way you'd wanna do it, but this works out pretty much. All right, whoopsies, we don't need to do a little star right there. You don't wanna have a pointer of a pointer, it just seems really bad. Invalid receiver, can we do this on, can we uh, grab one of those on here? Can we not do that? I thought we could do that on this one. Am I crazy you can't do that? I swear you could, oh, this is just such disappoint. Such disappoint, okay, we can't do that. I might be rusting inside my head. All right, fine, we'll do it on the data. Whatever. <sighs> Whatever. Uh, I, sometimes I put in too many things in my head. All right, there we go. So we went over, we're gonna do has email on the data. It's gonna go over all of its contacts, see if it can find a contact that's email's true, and there we go. Yeah, awesome. Let's go, so we're, good, we're, we're happy about that. So we're gonna go down here and I'm gonna go like this. If email, if data has email, I want to render something back. I want to render some sort of error. I wanna say, hey, you're a 400. Hey, things have gone wrong. So I'm gonna replace this with the 400. We're gonna render a 400. And now we need to display some sort of error here. So we have that thing called form. 
you may, you may remember our well-named form right here, but we're gonna need to have some more information stored here. I want to be able to return down a form that has its previous values, and I also wanna be able to return down a form that has uh, some errors within it. And so let's jump back here and let's do that. So I'm gonna create something called uh, type form data, which is a struct, which has a values, which is gonna be a map string string, and we'll have errors, map string string. Just keep it simple for now, pretty generic. Maybe not the way you want to do that, that's fine. And then I'm gonna have a new form data, hey, thank you very much, which is just simply gonna say, hey, we're gonna make those things, because if you don't make a map, you may not realize this. It's one of Golang's many downfalls, is that if you don't make a map, it's a nil pointer, and things go kaboom. It's the most, just it's just so annoying. Just, well, just give me a zero value map. That's all I want in my life. I know so, gophers are gonna come out and be like, well, actually, did you know the reason why? I don't wanna hear your reason why, it makes me angry, okay? All right, now that I got done with that fairly that useless. Exactly <laughs> Okay, that it was safe. Shake my finger. Yeah, I shake my finger at the silly things, right? All right, so now that we got that, well, actually, you know. All right, so now that we did that, let's think about how we want to do this form data. Well, we don't care if this looks pretty, so I'm just simply gonna go like this. If uh, values uh, name, oh yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll keep it lowercase, why? You know, it is what it is. Uh, value equals value name, easy, awesome. We'll do the exact same thing right here and we'll replace name with email, all right? So if we have an email, put the email in the value, all right? Pretty easy, I know a lot of people are like, well, what about placeholder? We're not, again, we're not trying to focus on the beauty aspect here, we're just trying to focus on the practical use of HTML. So now we need to do something really important, which is uh, if uh, errors.email, well, then we need to display this wonderful error message. So, oh yeah, look at that, I'm gonna erase this. We even got ourselves a red error. So we're gonna have an email error that says, hey, there was an error here. We're gonna display this as the form. It's now part of our form. Forms, by the way, are awful. They always turn into this. They're always just a huge nightmare of just previous values and filling things in and doing all that. So fun times. I've never met a form I liked. So now that we have form looking like this, we're probably gonna need to make several changes here. All right, so. Be prepared. So let's jump back to our server. Let's first deal with this part right here. Word like this, form data equals new form data. Beautiful, I'm gonna go form data values is name. I'm gonna do form data value uh, email is email. And then I need to do form data email. <laughs> look at that copilot, look at that. It's like you knew what I was doing. Uh, we're gonna add in the error, emails already exist. Easy peasy, pumpkin seedsy, pass in the form data. But now that we've done that, we've also screwed up our index page. You can no longer refresh because everything's gonna have all these errors. These properties don't exist. So let's create a quick little index page right here. Type, uh, I'll just call it page, why not? Uh, struct, and it's gonna have data, which is the data, and we're gonna have form, which is the form data. Easy peasy, look at, look at how beautiful this programming is. It's really not beautiful. No one should be impressed by this, by the way. Everyone should be fairly upset about this. Uh, instead, so now we're just gonna do a nice little new page just so I don't have to do any of that. Uh, can I just do this? Oh yeah, oh yeah, new data, there we go. Uh, and then just hit them with one of those. Look at this, just the world's greatest programming going on here. So instead of using a data, let's use a page and go new page. There we go, we have our empty page. It's absolutely fantastic. We're gonna use page in our index. We're gonna have to use page all the way down here, page.data, and things, oh, data with a capital D. There we go. We're gonna have to do the whole uh, page.data with a capital D. Uh, yeah, there we go, page.data with a capital D. We're gonna display with the page, fantastic. All right, I think everything is looking nice right now. All right, so there we go. So we have the form, we have all that. Let's upgrade our templates as well because our templates, our index template currently doesn't actually pass the correct stuff around. So we'll just jump in here. Uh, and instead of passing the object, uh, the form, I'm gonna just do form. And for the display, I'm just gonna do data. All right, kind of got those things through. Things are nice. So now that means our form object here is that. All right, so that's pretty much everything that we're gonna need to do. We still kind of have some question marks around here. To do, question mark, what do we do down here? But let's first make sure we can trigger this and see that thing work. 
And if everything's gone good, look at that, we have that. If everything's gone good, we can refresh. Okay, we got some good stuff here. I'm gonna click this email. I should have made the email so much easier. And you know what, in fact, I'm gonna jump back here. I'm gonna go back to GD. Gosh dang, gosh dang. I didn't even, it's not even GD. Uh, let's go like that. And I'm gonna make it AOEU, because that I use Dvorak, by the way. By the way, I use Dvorak, and that's just my home row on this finger, makes it super easy to use. Uh, so now that we have that there, I can just refresh that. Oh, look at that. So now I should be giving a duplicate email, right? So when I create this, it should actually display a problem. What, what happened? Well, let's check the network tab, just to make sure. Well, we got the 400s. The 400s has, the, it has this. What the heck's going on? Well, several things. We didn't do several things correct, okay? First off, look at our targeting. Our targeting totally sucks, okay? We're not targeting the right stuff here. So let's just jump back and make sure we're targeting the right stuff. Uh, we're gonna just take out the target. We're gonna, when you submit a form, its default target is itself. Okay, problem number one solved. Does that solve our problem? Well, of course not. It does not solve our problem. We have one other thing that's wrong. We responded with a 400. By default, HTMX is not going to do uh, display 400s, right? Because that would be really bad. You don't know what's coming down with your server. Second off, is 400 even the right status code? Technically, you should probably use something like 422. A 400 means that you've made a bad request. Did we make a bad request? No. Semantically, we made a very correct request. Here you go. We actually did a 422. The entity itself was unprocessable. So let's first do that. Let's change it to a 422 to be more semantically correct, even though now we're kind of getting into the pedantics and some people are like, ooh, I don't like that. I do like this for this specific reason because it really allows uh, HTMX to be the driver of your application state by having very proper status codes. Because the second thing we're gonna do is we're gonna update and add this little script to our index. This little script, when we load the content, will add a body uh, or an event listener to the body before swap. HTMX emits this event before it swaps out the content. And what we're gonna do is say, hey, if this is a 422, we know this is good, so therefore we should swap and this is not an error. And so we're gonna tell HTMX on 422s, we want to actually display what's going to happen because this is, this is something we want. And so this is another reason why using very precise uh, uh, what's it called status codes allows you to actually have really precise behavior where you want it. And so this is kind of cool. This is kind of like a little cool little thing right here. So I'm gonna jump over here. Maybe some people don't think it's cool. I think it's cool. So I'm gonna go down here and right into my HTML, not even have it formatted well. We're just gonna put it in there. And now when we refresh, we should be able to see this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing happen. So I'm gonna go AOEU, AOEU. I'm gonna try to create contact and it's gonna say, hey, contact already exists. We could add it so I could throw in like an autofocus here or a select here on the email to kind of make this thing happen well. We could do all the designing of the behavior you want your HTML to do uh, in the back end, or you could really add it to the front end if you were really, really excited about doing more JavaScript in your front end. But at this point, we had a 422 response and we are correctly identifying where to update stuff. Kind of cool, right? It's kind of exciting. I'm kind of excited. I like it. I don't know. I think this is kind of fun because we're starting to break down problems in engineering paths. There's design patterns that are starting just to emerge where you can handle forms in a very generalized way, at least the response for errors and then how we're going to drive in changes. Okay. I don't know. I kind of find this very exciting because I just, I love the idea of being able to think of things in patterns, not how do you want to do it? How did the person design error handling in their form. Well, you look at any form, it's all gonna be unique. It could be tons of different libraries that it's using. It could require JSON to some other library format. You're just doing series of translations. Here, we're literally just going from server state into HTML. It just feels good, feels simple. So can we, so we can render errors. Well, what about success? So now we gotta start thinking about out of band updates because right now our form replaces itself. So let's go back here and let's think about what we can do down here. Once we have our contacts here, we want to just render just the contacts. I know we're gonna fix the problem of too many contacts, but right now let's just think about the very narrow case of form is good, update contacts. So instead of, instead of doing, uh, let's see, what are we doing right here? We do a display, display is the right thing. I think this looks pretty good, except for if we have a success, What's gonna happen? Let's find out what happens if we have a success with our current one. I'm gonna put in a little bracket there, create contact, and now what, what are we getting? 
What are we getting? Why can't I, why can't I see you? Oh, well, let's, that was that was strange. Email already exists. Let's just make sure I have everything. Why am I getting a? Oh, we're getting a 500. What the heck's happening here? Let me just make sure. Uh, can evaluate field contacts. Okay, we're actually having the classic. I didn't update the templates. As we, just as we talked about earlier, what are we gonna do right here? Let's do the right thing. So right now I can just simply do a, uh, not page, but page data, because remember we're displaying the contacts. I know again, we probably should have just called it contacts. We're cutting corners, people. We're cutting corners, people. Let's refresh that. And now we do that and look at this. Our form went away and all of our contacts suck. Because why? Why did our form go away and why do we have two sets of contacts? Replace itself. Yep, it replaced itself. Perfect. All right. So we need to do an out of band update. So I'm going to jump back over here to my templates and I'm going to go down here and let's pull out a contact. So block contact. Notice I named this one correctly. I felt pretty adventurous today, maybe a little enterprisey. I just felt like it was the right move to do right here. So I have this nice little contact that we're going to put right here. And I'm going to go uh, template. Uh, what is it? Contact. Perfect. So that should all just work out just to make sure. Hit that refresh, we're looking good. And now I'm gonna do what is referred to as an out of band contact. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna call this OOB contact. Inside of here, I'm gonna render out a template that is contact. Right here, I need to add two things. I need to add uh, two HTMX that I want this thing to replace some other item on the screen. So I'm gonna go like this, H, uh, HX uh, swap out of band. So this attribute allows you to specify that some content in the response should be swapped into the DOM somewhere else other than the target. So you can kind of imagine that we're almost creating like a real time video game. We are based on the user input, we are now updating the display. And we're kind of doing this game of how we're doing stuff. So that's how, kind of like how I like to, to look at it, right? So we are going to add an H, we're gonna add in a selector. I'm gonna say contacts. So swap me out to contacts, fantastic. And then also notice that I am just doing a singular contact here. I'm not doing all the contacts. So let's think about how we can do this in a more singular way. So instead of just doing a swap out of bands right here, let's do a uh, HX, or hold on. Let, uh, let's do, oops, ah! Uh, let's do after begin. After begin will prepend the content before the first uh, child inside the target. And then I'm gonna add an ID to it, that's contacts. So now I've given it all the information. I want you to target contacts, and I want you to swap yourself in at the front of the list. Not destroy the list, just swap yourself in to the front of the list. Pretty fun times, so this is looking kind of neat. So this is called an out of band contact. So if I go here, I'm gonna do this, contact equals, uh, Oopsies. Uh, let's do one of those. Oh, we, we're gonna definitely want that in there. And we're gonna want contact. There we go. And I'm just gonna pass in contact. And we're gonna do OOB contact. So now let's see what happens here. I'm gonna refresh this. I'm gonna do an AOE, AOEU. All right, that already exists. So let's put a one inside there. Okay, well, it did add it to the front of the list. Awesome. But where did our form go? Our form disappeared. What the heck happened there? It's like I already knew where the, this is a great question. Who designed this? It's actually, okay, so does anyone have a guess where the form went? Anybody? There's just no content. Did it replace, it's sending back nothing for the, the main content. This man is ready right here. You're ready for HTMX, yes. So we sent back nothing from the server and we sent back an out of band update. So it said, okay, I see an out of band update. I'll take that out of band update. All right, what's the remaining content? Oh, nothing. All right, well, my form says replace outer uh, with the contents from the response. You spent nothing or you sent nothing. We replace something with nothing, fantastic. So we can easily fix that by just doing one extra render. C dot uh, render, and let's do, uh, we can do, what is it, uh, form. Now we need a, a new 
form uh, data. There we go, just render it blank. We don't want all the names and everything in there. So absolutely fantastic. Uh, we're not gonna do an error check. It's warning me to do an error check. We're really good at this. I mean, I could put in there, look at that. I even have it on a little macro just in case, a little quick one. If I just need to throw in an error or an error, an error, an error, you know, I can just do it really quickly. Just, I'm so ready, so ready for go right now. Uh, so now that we've done that, when I refresh it and I put in AOEU one or plus sign, why not? It will add it to the front and then give us a new form. So when we look at the response, what do we get here? We get the following. We get our main content and we get our out of bands updates somewhere else within the web application. All right. All right, all right, that's kind of, it's kind of neat, right? Is it kind of neat? Do we got some thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs sideways? One in the chat if you're really excited about this. Oh yeah, we got a wall of ones. We're feeling good. A lot of ones in front of Master's chat too. Okay, I see, I see a couple not ones, not happy about that, but you know, you can't win them all, okay? You can't win them all. So let's look at the uh, let's look at the HTML and ensure that this is correct. I actually have no idea if this is going to be correct or not. I put this in here because there should have been an error, but I may have actually programmed it correct. I'm thinking I know I programmed it correct by accident. All right, so let's see what do we got here. Well, okay, I mean that 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 is all correct. Our form is all correct. So I think what I was supposed to do is I was supposed to forget to do the old HX swap on the outer and then we'd start having forms embedding themselves within it. It creates no actual problem. It's just inside, I just, I don't want potential problems, right? I don't want the occasion for a problem. So I goofed up, I goofed up there and now look at us, just disappoint. All right, so I accidentally programmed something correct. Ugh. I knew it was gonna happen. I just knew for a fact I'd do it correctly when I wasn't supposed to do it correctly. All right, there's all our code. A lot of code here, a lot of stuff. Oh, by the way, I, I threw this in here at the end. Sometimes when I'm testing, I just throw a little test block in here. I'll highlight it red, put it like a big red block so I can kind of see where things are going if I want to just test. Like when, I'm just, when I was just learning, I found this to be super useful. So I'd highly recommend that. Also another kind of super useful thing, uh, if, you're, if you're just kind of new and you're trying to discover what is going on in HTMX, what available stuff it has, uh, I suggest turning on all. And when you execute that, when we add another contact, uh, you'll see that it does a whole bunch of stuff right here. It has, uh, let's go all the way up to the tippy top. We have the trigger, what triggered it. We can listen to that. So we can listen to the trigger that started some HTMX event. We can listen to a confirm case. We can say, hey, validation. Every We can do a validation case on it, validation case on this one. We can add in a config request, validate URL before request, before send. Then it does all the uh, XHR stuff. And then afterwards, we have a before swap event. Notice that we actually use the before swap event. Uh, if you go back to right here, that's where we did this whole DOM listener. Before we swap in the content, let's make sure that we can respond to error codes in a way we want to respond to error codes. And so there is quite a bit of stuff that you can actually respond to, and including every single element that got cleaned up also goes through this before cleanup element. So you can actually really go in there and you can really be quite expressive with what you would like to do. You just don't have to. If you just don't, if you don't want to, that's fine. There's also after swap, after request, after load, uh, after settle, meaning that Everything has been replaced on the DOM. There's no more delays. All the throttles or everything are all done. Here you go, we're in a new finished state. So then you can do something else at that point. You can add a set timeout one and then close your modal. Uh, I'm not a big fan of modals or modals, however you want to pronounce it. I think that's like a that's like a North Coast versus West Coast pronunciation issue. North Coast being Montana, greatest state in the union. All right. Question from the chat, is Echo handling the HTML serialization with c.render? Okay, so is Echo handling the HTML serialization with render? So I'm not super familiar with uh, Echo, but effectively what is happening when you do a dot render, it calls your renderer's render function. So remember at the very beginning of the class, we have this function right here, renderer. And so it will call that function with a name, a data, a context, and then where to write that value to. And so that way, when we execute the template, it produces a string, but that string, instead of just returning you the string of the template, instead it writes that string into the writer. The writer is supposed to be you know, a nice efficient way so you don't have to have nearly as much memory allocations. Maybe it has a nice a large buffer. There might be a way to pre-configure how much underlying starting memory a, mem a writer starts with. I have no idea, but that would be fantastic. So that way you, know, you could have some nice, some delicious efficiencies there. Uh, but when you call render, notice that we do a pass in a string and we pass in some data. 
If we go back up, uh, if we go back up to the top, notice that we get a name and we get a piece of data that is, uh, if for those that are the Go uninitiated, interface squirrely is effectively any in TypeScript. It's not any, but you can imagine it's any. The easiest way to put it, it just says, hey, it's a type. I don't know, go figure it out yourself. Uh, so there you go. So yeah, that's all, that's all that happens right there. I don't really understand exactly what happens underneath the hood, but I know most of that happens. You can use any now, but okay, so for those that are talking about Go, that any is completely different than a TypeScript any, okay? It's, it's not even the same. It, it, it's more like a template T than it is an any. That's just ridiculous. Don't be ridiculous. All right, let's get back to HTMX. This is really where we're gonna try to make it a touch more interactive, a touch more exciting, maybe show that there are ways to add more client side just stuff than is uh, there right now. So we're gonna talk about deleting and events. So we need a good icon if we're gonna do deleting. I did ask Chat Jippity uh, to give me an icon. It produced this savage for me. And yes, I call these savages. If I'm gonna call them pings, I gotta call them savages, okay? You can't just choose one and not the other one, okay? And so here we go. We're gonna copy the savage code. You're gonna definitely want this code. If you're gonna want that savage, go ahead, take it. It's beautiful. It is now yours. So what we're gonna do, is uh, we, we want to do some deleting, but I want to highlight a really cool part of HTMX. Uh, you can use actual verbs, not like fake verbs, okay? We're not doing a post, getting a 200 back, and getting a 400 error status underneath. We're actually using real endpoints with real verbs. That means you no longer have to do this stupid thing. How many people did that with all, all the fun times back in the day, where you'd have get and post, and then you'd also have like a post contact slash delete slash ID. You like put the verb inside of the, the, the path. It's kind of annoying, it's kind of dumb. So with HTMX, we can just, we can just do the thing, you know? We, we can, you can just do it. And so it's fantastic. Would you look at that? Like, would you look at that right now? We have contacts slash ID, very excited. I'm very excited about that. So we're gonna update our HTML. Let's add a delete icon next to an address. An address, of course, is, is a name and an email address. And so we're gonna first include the icon next to the address. We're gonna make a delete handler for contacts slash ID. And then next, we're gonna make an endpoint. Uh, we're gonna make endpoint updates for this, okay? So should be pretty easy. Let's do this. All right. Is there any way you could post the current code to like a branch? We could post the current code to a branch. Yeah, let's do that. Let's just do that right now. Uh, get stat, get status. Uh, I'm gonna go like this. Get add this, get commit, uh, Batman. And we're gonna check out B, uh, check, uh, checkpoint one. There we go. Get push origin, checkpoint one. Boom, there you go. So it's up there right now. You can go get that code so you can start exactly in a fresh location where I'm at because from here on out, our programming won't be nearly as extensive. Because that first part, you know, anytime you start a project, there's like a lot of things you kind of got to do. Now we're going to get into the finer grain detail, okay? We're going to go deep in. So, are you guys ready? Everyone ready? Everyone has the delete icon? I don't think I have the delete icon anymore. I'm not sure if I copied and pasted it over it. So there we go. Just in case I have the delete icon, we're feeling good, looking good. I'll put it one more time inside Twitch chat. And let's start. All right, so we're gonna jump over to our templates. And I said we're gonna go all the way down to our contact. And now we need to put this little delete icon in there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go like this. Style equals display flex. Flex on those kids without tailwind. I am now, oh, not that one. I'm now gonna put in the savage. I'm gonna wrap it like every good thing you do in HTML. You put divs around it. What is that? I don't care, put a div on it. And then I'm gonna go uh, style equals with one rem. I forgot what rem stands for, but I think it's root font size because em stands for font size. Classic, really. Uh, and so now, look at that. We got a little trash can icons right next to that. How great is that? Oh, that's beautiful. Let's also add in a little pointer. So when we put our pointer over it, we get like the little finger on it. You know, that always makes me feel good, right? Uh, cursor pointer, right? So that should make it go. Oh yeah, look at that. You can't even see it because my, like, okay. It's not the size of the cursor that really matters here, but it's really tiny. I can barely even see it, but it is a pointer icon. All right, absolutely beautiful. Again, we're not concerned about all the other things that make HTML. So for those that are wondering about accessibility, you can do accessibility. We're just not doing it right now because that requires like a degree in of itself. You know, that's people walk, people go on like conference circuits to talk about it. It's a complicated topic. And 
I'm just not a good enough HTML engineer to know all the things. All right, so now we have this delicious icon right here. Next, we need to make it do a delete to the uh, icon's ID. Or, I mean, uh, whoa. We need to make it do a request to uh, contacts ID. Obviously, you probably go, we don't have IDs for contacts. Well, we're gonna have to make one, okay? We have to make one now. All right, so let's go hx delete. This delete attribute call will cause an element to issue a delete request. Okay, fantastic. Let's absolutely do that. And let's go to contacts and then we'll do a slash ID. Oh yeah, look at that. Looks good, right? It's looking good. This is feeling good. And then I'm gonna also do uh, a little ID up here and call this contact. And then we're gonna put an ID on this one. This is for a future problem that we will see. We'll get there, don't worry about it. So okay, so we have this nice delete. So now, how do we say what to delete? Because if I just issue this request and we successfully delete, what is HMAX gonna remove? It should remove the HTML connected to that contact. It will remove currently the savage inside of this div, right? Because it always, the default behavior is swap inner HTML. So we need to have a different swap potential strategy. So let's first have hx swap equals outer HTML. So now we will delete this div, but we're still only deleting the trash can. So we need to do something a little bit different. Let's also add in hx target equals, so normally if you're, if you can, you can use something called closest, which is a CSS, which does a selector upwards and will check your ancestor. So technically you could do something like this, except for I am a div myself. Therefore closest will also consider yourself as part of the selector thing. That's just welcome to web three delicious standards here. Very annoying. I wish it just did parent and, uh, and beyond because that'd be super useful. Cause I could just say, hey, delete my parent div and it would just boom and it would work. So we can't do that. So I'll just go like this contact, um, do you like how it does that little shift every time? I don't know what that is. There we go. So fantastic. So now we're saying, hey, who to delete, how to delete it, what endpoint to get, go to. I think we're effectively ready. Uh, let's do a little refresh. It says internal error. Why does it say an internal error? Anybody, anyone want to make a guess? No ID. No ID, bam. Gosh, this guy, it's like you program go. It's just like, you know, you know it, you could feel it. All right. So I'm gonna go up to my little uh, contact form and I'm just gonna go var ID equals zero, why not? This is why, by the way, if you're wondering why I did a little new contact here, it's like I was pre-prepared for this eventuality we're having right here. So there we go. Uh, okay, 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 okay. Uh, and there we go. Everything's been specified, we're looking good, fantastic. I don't think I technically need this one. Yeah, I don't, even need, I don't even need it. All right, so there we go. Uh, awesome, so now we have an ID on the contact forms, which means every single time we create a contact, it will come with an ID, which is also why I use these functions right here. So now even our dummy data, we have IDs, we're feeling good, everything's looking good. We go back here, we hit refresh, everything's there. Let's look at the HTML just to validate that we have actually done the thing. Let's bring it down, bring it down. Look at that, look at that, we have contact one, we're flexing on the kids. This thing is saying, hey, target contact one, swap out our HTML. So if I click it, let's bring up the old uh, network, and I click that, look at what happened. It said, hey, that's not found. Why not? Well, we did a 404 because there's nothing there. We haven't added the handler yet. But it did the right thing. It went to contact slash one and issued a delete request. Oh, it's like proper. We're just so proper at this point. So let's do an e dot delete. Uh, slash uh, contacts ID, fantastic. Uh, let's get the ID string equals uh, that. I'll do ID and uh, er equals stir convert. I mean, maybe I could have done something better here, but I didn't do something better here. Throw in one of those. If we hit that, I'm just gonna return a e dot string 400, right? Uh, is that, no, it's, it's C, sorry, C dot string. So if you're not using our UI, and you're somehow by going around this, I'm just gonna issue simple responses out, right? If you're using our UI, you're not gonna be running into these situations. Now you could say, yes, you could run into the situation. You're running into it because it's been deleted by two windows being open. 
okay, I hear you. We could plan for that. We could send back already deleted, doesn't exist, and just have the content zip out anyways because we know that we've created something or something's on the screen that's out of sync with the server, uh, which is always the ultimate problem of, of all things involving uh, the web, just continuously out of sync. So we're gonna go all the way back up to the data and let's add in one more function. Uh, function d uh, data find con or ooh let's go index of con uh, this uh, and we'll do let's see what do we want to do we want to do id right so there we go so we're just going to return out the contact I mean we could make it nice like that and Copilot will pretty much do it for us all right awesome and we don't want to do that actually we want to do an index of don't we uh, let's return out the index that was found here or uh, negative one. I guess we could two do the other way. I'm not sure why I did an index one. Why did I do an index one? Did I do it? Do I have a good reason for it? I don't think I have a good reason for it. Uh, index one, it's just in my head, that's what I was doing. So we're gonna keep on doing the thing I already built. And we could actually do, yeah, we could do, we could have just used the nil as that. Else, we need to simply delete out this. Oh, that's why I did the, oh, that's why I had to delete it out. That's the thing we gotta do. And I knew it. And so let's just do the little, little deletion here. All right, fantastic, let's just make sure this is good. We're gonna have page up to index, and then we're gonna start from index plus one and on. Okay, awesome. We've now created this wonderful contacts right here. Uh, we've updated our contacts. Now we need to return something from this deletion, which of course, C dot uh, no content 200, right? We're just gonna return an empty reply, you got it. So I'm gonna refresh this, and when I hit delete, it's gone, look at that. Inline deleting, refresh, nothing is there. Hit the save on the server, we're back. We just rehydrated the data, okay. Okay, so inline deleting, we can inline delete. Okay, this is positive, this is positive motions here. Hopefully everyone's excited about this. Fantastic, look at all this code. We have really coded up a huge amount. But still, this doesn't feel interactive, right? We want it to feel like something's happening, because right now, it just kind of like pops out. You don't know if a request has been made. You don't know what's happening. Are you gonna press it multiple times? Are you freaked out? You could be freaked out. So let's start by adding a simple time delay right here. So I'm gonna go sleep and hopefully one second. Pretty good. I'm gonna first start it off with three seconds. So it's like really obvious to see and feel the terribleness of this. So I'm gonna just press this button. Look at this. Is it requesting? We don't even know. What the, okay, there we go. It got deleted. It just disappeared. If you had a big list of items, all of a sudden something shifted, it might be very hard to see. It's not a great experience. We should probably fix all of these things at the same time. So we have two options. We have HX indicator and swap delays. Both are very exciting and both solve different problems. So let's start off with the indicator, okay? I want you to add these two lines to your server, which is just saying, hey, statically serve these directories. Um, I'll paste it in Twitch chat. Boomer websites are the best. I mean, fair, fair statement. All right, so I'm gonna go up to the tippity top up here and I'm just gonna say, hey, there you go. Serve out images, serve out CSS. That's why I had you kind of use this project to begin with because there is CSS, there is images. You can look at it. We have some stuff in there that's gonna be nice. So pretty simple right there. Next, we need to add the CSS link so that we have this beautiful CSS on here. It's only like three lines of CSS. So I'm gonna go back to my template, go up to the tippity top, go to the head, add that wonderful piece of code right there. If you wanna use the course website, go for it. Uh, there we go, and we also have this little beautiful image that we're gonna be using. I took this directly from the HTMX website, okay? It's my image now, that's mine. It's our image, all right? All right, fantastic. I just tried to literally quick, uh, I just typed in colon right enter on a website. That's not how you copy something. It's just, it's, it's just, I can't help but to do that. It's just, it's just in my head. But just do it. All right. Uh, so let's go and let's add that line. What was the line? Sorry, I got completely confused there. All right. So let's go all the way down here. We want to add one more item to this contact. I'm going to add in this beautiful image right here. So let's just see what the image looks like. It's a little loading icon right there. How nice is that little loading icon? our icon that is. All right, so I'm gonna add one more item to it. It's gonna call it div class equals HTMX indicator. Now that is what that CSS is for. This is a generalized way to solve this problem. And so you can use this for all indicators. So let's look at that CSS one more time. If you have indicator on your class, we set your opacity to zero and we have a transition of 500 milliseconds if it were to become visible. 
Then remember how there's all those events that happen with HTMX? Well, when an element is a part of a request, HTMX request will be added to its class list. So notice that I say this, if one of our parents has an HTMX request, then our opacity becomes one. If we have that, our opacity becomes one. So we can kind of define both possibilities. And so that way we can load an indicator and show it upon request. So now we have that nice delay, everything should be good. So let's refresh it. Obviously nothing's there. When I click delete, what happened? Well, nothing, we didn't actually add the indicator. So let's go back over here. And when we do a delete, I'm gonna add one more attribute here and go HX indicator equals. Now we need to have some way to target it. So we'll add a simple ID, ID equals contact indicator uh, ID. Oh yeah, oh yeah, look at that beauty. That is beautiful, isn't it? There we go. We now have, hey, the indicator for this action exists in this location. And so when that happens, it's going to do all the addition of things you need it to do. So pretty nice. So I'm gonna hit refresh. And now when I hit the delete, that thing will nicely show up during the duration of the request and then be removed when it's done. If we look at the actual elements, let's look at the actual elements so we can see what happens here. So when I hit that delete, notice that HTMX, or, uh, HTMX request is just added automatically to that class for you. So you don't have to think about it. It allows you to have these things added. And there's actually more classes that we can, we can get, which we will get here in just one second. So that is one way to add some level of, um, of interactivity. It's good, but it's still, I mean, it's shockingly declarative, right? We pretty much declared exactly how our element behave and including where our indicator is and how it should behave. So that's nice, but it's still not as good. So now we're gonna add something called a swap delay. So I want you to update your CSS with this small little thing right here, contact slash or contact.htmx swapping. It's beautiful, okay? And you could obviously just make this generalized. You could have a single way you do this, or you could have it a unique way for each one. We could use the max height thing, though trying to, trying to animate on max height is extremely difficult, and there's all these CSS hacks you have to do just to get height to go downwards. Oh my goodness. I hate CSS sometimes. I just wanna just, th just punch it, just hate it. Anyways, okay, so we have contact. We have this, I'm gonna add it to the CSS. So I'm just gonna walk over to the CSS and I'm just gonna paste this little bit in. Yes, my, my CSS is clearly a skill issue. So we have this beautiful little piece of CSS right here. So I'm gonna go back to this and now we obviously want to add, I mean, now we're getting into like full front end here. Now we have this nice little class contact on it. So we know how to say, hey, which one's gonna have this? Now, when we do this, uh, this right here, what's gonna end up happening, whoopsies, um, is that, let's go back here. So now you can see it. This right here, we have a target on it. When the target happens, before the swap happens, it adds an additional class, HTMX swap or swapping. And it's gonna say, hey, we're swapping out this element. So if you need to do something with it, you now have one visual hook in your CSS to do something with it. And it also has something else, which is I can go swap for 500 milliseconds. I want you to just give me 500 milliseconds on this so I can make something pretty myself. So when we go back here and I click delete, it will do the whole indication for three seconds and then the swap will happen We'll do that nice little fade out and then it goes away. Now you imagine again, you can do the whole height thing. You can make it into a much smoother experience. You can kind of choose what you want to do here. And so it's just another way in which HTMX just gives you a bunch of events to tap into. It's kind of your responsibility to go the nine yards on this. And so I don't know, I like that. I think it's really, really simple. And I think it really shows a great way to make nice tools fairly simple, right? Because most of our life is making tools. Very few things are maintaining very wonderful, awesome websites you know, all the little ancillary things around it. You don't need to have an entire monolithic application for just the simple stuff. Frontend Masters helps you take control of your skills and gain the confidence you need to advance in your career. Our practical, real-world courses are taught by experts working on large-scale applications at companies like Netflix, Stripe, Google, and more. No one goes deeper into the foundations of JavaScript, and we continue to grow further into design and backend. We have curated learning paths built from hundreds of courses. Whether you're a junior, mid-level, or a senior developer looking to expand your skills, these paths will give you the foundations you need to reach the next stage of your career. 
Plus, all of our courses are recorded live throughout the year, giving you the opportunity to ask your questions directly to our instructors. This allows us to keep our courses fresh and up to date with the latest best practices. Grab a membership today and gain the confidence and the skills you need to get to the next stage of your career. Uh, there's a couple more things I want to just talk about. First off, practice makes perfect. You kind of got to know and use these for a little bit and you'll discover new items. I made this really stupid example here for a quick second uh, that is just like this really nice little, look at that. And I used V0, so look how pretty that is. I didn't design any of that. And when you click it, it does all that nice stuff. We did this all today. Went over here, made sure that you can't have a valid email. And when, I, when you hit subscribe, it disables the button for a little bit of time while the, the request is happening and then gives you that nice little error. Like that's nice and pretty. It feels pretty, it looks pretty. Uh, and I did that all with V0 plus a little bit of HTMX. So pretty easy. We could do in between swaps as well. So we have these nice transition between scenes. Just didn't do any of that stuff. Um, and we're gonna go over a couple examples from the book to kind of show more of the engineering aspect of HTMX. Okay, there's a lot more examples in here. Go check them out. Uh, first off, a current URL can be controlled by uh, HTMX, which is really great. So as we make transitions through our app, if you wish to update the URL, you can do that. Uh, you can choose how you want it. You can say, hey, don't update the URL. So when we do a body swap, you don't want to update the URL, then hey, don't update the URL. So we can do all, all, all those kind of things. So let's say we wanted to create a contacts page. And we, so when you clicked on a contact, it actually went to a page with all the information. But we also wanted to be able to delete from the page. Our current delete endpoint wouldn't work that way, right? Because it just tries to, it will send down no contact what, or no content. What would happen? Well, the button would disappear. You wouldn't know that the, the contact has been deleted. We just wouldn't have an experience there. So what should happen? Well, first we can create a very simple delete button with a nice little indicator. We can push the URL. So when we do a change with the button, it will actually save that change and update our URL. We can target the body if we want to, but again, we're just sending down no content. So it'd be kind of weird. We just make the page go blank. So what we can do is we can actually do a couple things. Well, first off, we can always disable the button during the request. Here's a nice little, you know, here's a simple JavaScript function that I have that you could just attach to the window called disable button. You pass any button that you create into it and it will automatically listen to the request and disable it during the, the lifetime of a request. Pretty simple to make, right? Uh, not only that, but how do we do the delete on the contacts page? How would that work? Well, you have to understand a 303. And so first, what you're probably thinking is that if you were to delete on a contact page, you would press the delete button it would go to the server, it would do a delete, and if you're in a modern front-end world, you'd need to tell your client or your front-end to do a navigation to a separate page and make sure that the data is up to date and rehydrate your data, make sure that your local cache matches your server. In more of this kind of like HTMX world, you would do the standard, which is to actually do a delete to the server. The server responds with the 302, but if you do a 302, a 302 redirect carries forward the verb. And so that would cause you to call delete on slash. So that wouldn't be good. What you would want to do is a 303. If you do a 303, it, will carry, it won't carry forward the, the verb. Instead, it will do a get on the slash or on whatever kind of 303 next thing. And so if we push the URL, like we said earlier, if we push the URL and do the delete, we'll get the indicator to show up. We'll disable the button. When the response happens and it does a 303, our URL will be updated to make sure it's now at slash and we will have that contact deleted and everything be done. And so another thing I'd like to, you know, to kind of deconfuse if you're doing inline or not inline, you can just literally add a redirect to true, right? You can kind of go back to the old days where you don't have to come up with super generalized solutions for every single problem. Just come up with the solution for the problem at hand. This would make the whole thing just simply work, right? So I like that you could make it a link and do a boost. There's all sorts of different kind of tricks you can do. I actually really like this, uh, that approach. I feel like it's very engineering, right? I know how to set up a problem to do that for any type of content, and it's very simple to follow the logical steps throughout your application. All right, next problem. You have too many contacts, right? This would definitely happen to the point where you couldn't just send down a page full of contacts. It would absolutely just destroy your experience. So there are non-standard events in HTMX Trigger, which include load, reveal, and intersect. So if you're doing some CSS fancy magic, intersect allows for a scroll Y, scroll X kind of offset, whereas reveal simply has if an element is visible onto the viewport, I want you to trigger an action. And so it's kind of a cool way to be able to load content more, like kind of when you're on Twitter and you're scrolling down, 
I want to add a final element that's like, hey, when I show up, do something. You could also be pretty clever about that. You could put that element maybe further into the list and then do two updates, a no content update to delete that thing, plus an out of bands update to add more things to the list so that way you can trigger a request earlier before the content all runs out. A lot, a lot of little strategies here. But I made a little program called Blocks. Remember Blocks? We talked about Blocks earlier at the very beginning of the course. I can kind of show you what that looks like. Here we go. Very, very simple. We have our template right here that does infinite scrolling. And all Blocks does is it will simply make a block with the ID that was added to the block. And if there are more to reveal, then I'll do a trigger on reveal, swap the outer HTML of this div element. So meaning what comes back from the server, this div will be replaced with. And I already have kind of effectively the cursor right here blocks start equals the next place to start at. So I can generate the URL I need to to con continue to go through my list of whatever it is. And that would look something like command. Oh, that's CMake, don't. <laughs> Let's not do any of that. that. That's just the worst stuff in the universe. All right. So if we did that, we go to, did I do it at 68? What did I do it at? Oh yeah, I did it at uh, 69 slash blocks, blocks. So if we look at the network, we'll see that it made two requests right off the rip because when this page landed, 10 was already in the viewport. That little thing was revealed, so then it added the next 10, and then that thing was still in the viewport and made that third request. And as I scroll down, it's gonna just start making requests making it feel like there's more content coming. You could do an HTMX indicator. You could have a little nice little spinner at the bottom so that way you know more content's coming. There's all sorts of interactions you can do. And this is a relatively unfun thing to program, generally, which has been made relatively simple, especially for a tool. Like how many times have you used a stupid build tool where you just wanna see more things and like that process just totally sucks. It just doesn't have to suck, right? It just, it really doesn't have to suck. You can make pretty simple servers to, to uh, manage to do all this stuff. Very simple. Uh, so contacts are the exact same thing. Add a reveal more at the end, scroll down. Well, what about filtering? Well, filtering is the same problem as the previous one because often, besides for the very simple case where you have 10 items, you don't need to make a server request. And I'm sure you could add some fancy JavaScript for this, but in general, you have many items. And so when you start filtering, you have to make a server request because you have to filter your 10,000 items down to some small match that you can display on the screen and then also add an active reveal if you need to. And so this is called active search. And here's a very simple example of an active search. You have a form that you can submit to search for contacts, but while you're typing, the input field is actually making requests and updating the element below. So ID search, uh, you can fill it in with the previous value if you want to. So in case you already have a search going and the page refreshes, you, you maintain all the same stuff. So you have a trigger on key up, delay for 200 milliseconds, in other words, throttling. And if the content's been changed, make a request to the server. You add some cached headers, add some sort of list to it, add some sort of key value. So if the contacts haven't changed, you can just use cached values from within your actual like browser cache, all sorts of good ways to do stuff here. And it's just a very simple method to do active searching. And so again, kind of engineering in a way. So I want you to feel that. I want you to see that HTMX, it's kind of whole goal is to kind of return to more of what like feels like a computer science -y or a very engineering way to approach problems. It doesn't feel like, how do you want to solve this? What ways can you envision? Do you want to write your own? Do we want to use Redux? What, what can we explore? It's like, no, there's actually a really defined way to do these things that's existed for a long time. Let's just do step-by-step -step procedures for everything because anyone can memorize these 10 patterns and be pretty successful at building tools. You're probably asking yourself how many uh, URLs uh, can be represented or how many states can be represented by URLs and HTTP codes. Well, quite a bit. Uh, you can do quite a bit of things with HTMX. Uh, here's some obvious examples that you would never use HTMX for. Uh, maps, it wouldn't make any sense. The Chrome could totally be uh, HTMX, but maps itself, you, you obviously need to add spreadsheets. Why would you ever do client, you know, compute, uh, compute side stuff instead of client side stuff. Conway's Game of Life, the actual game can be played, but if you wish to have something that can save states of Conway's Game of Life and all that, you could use HTMX to actually trigger all those events and do all the saving and loading and giving you a list of different games you've played before. I actually built this once just to kind of test it out to see if I can do a really nice rich client side experience where you have a game where you can select different items and draw your own Conway's life and then play Conway's life. So hopefully you like, subscribe, do all those things on Twitch. And there you go, that's really the entirety of the HTMX course. Hopefully that was not too much of a brief introduction, but enough to show you that there's quite a bit of things you can do with such a simple library. And again, the entire non-gzip size of, 
of HTMX is like 40K. Its gzip size is, I think, 12K. Uh, I've been to websites recently that all it was was a simple marketing page and its gzip size was 370K and its actual size was two megabytes, two megabytes of JavaScript to show some colored squares plus a buy button. Kind of wild to think about. Maybe, just maybe, we've jumped the shark here. Just saying, maybe we should consider something different for the simple things. If I put a delay in for the response, does it delay the server's response to other users on the site? I'm guessing no, but I'd like to know for sure. Oh, you're talking about uh, in HTMX the delay or in Go? Because obviously the Go one, that's an endpoint. We just put it intentional sleep. You'd never sleep in an endpoint intentionally. I mean, I have no idea why you would do that. If you're sleeping in an endpoint and there's an intention to it, you're doing something kind of wild, right? Uh, you're doing something that's maybe misdesigned there. But if you're doing it on the client side, yeah, it has no effect. All right, that's just your standard server client. I've also been- I mean, okay, to be real though, you could put in some small sleeps, like maybe some millisecond sleeps here and there. Then when your boss is like, we need to make things faster, what do you do? Start removing some of those sleeps. You know what I'm talking about? Improving endpoint performance. All right, Christmas is around the corner, people. Plan for it. Uh, I've also been told to reduce round trips to the server, and this seems to increase those. Does that slow the site down at all? Uh, it could and it couldn't. I don't know. I, I, I don't know if I buy that as an argument yet in the sense that you get to choose how much data you first front load as a server as you send down stuff and then you choose how much interaction or what interaction it takes. Like if you had, if you rendered a website that had uh, friends that you had to go click on, right? You could put all that stuff first on the page. But if you went and hovered over a friend to see a pop-up, do you think that they transferred all that data down before you ever put your mouse over that? Probably not. How much do you want to bet they're requesting that information? Now, as long as you have nice HTTP caching, you have ways you can, uh, you have some acceptance of potentially stale data, how you wish to model that, you can always cache it at a browser level for a lot of these requests, as long as you use the right verbs and all that. So there are ways you can do things that make sense to make it fast. Um, this is just one way. And I'm not saying this solves all problems. Maybe you want to use your own JavaScript requesting slash library slash rendering to do this. And there are some cases where it makes sense. I can think of something Dax recently built. If you don't know who Dax is, he's on Twitter. He has the spiciest takes of all time. And he built this thing that's super, super fast, super smooth feeling. And it's all about like viewing and introspecting data logs from your server. To me, that seems like, yeah, you're gonna want to really think about your caching for that one. Cause you really don't wanna just be hitting servers, grabbing logs, causing a bunch of transfer. You don't wanna be interrupting production and all that. And you want it to be really, really nice and highly cached. Yeah, I could see you wanting to do it then. Do you have to? I mean, maybe you don't. Maybe you want to cache it at a browser get level and that's fine. And then you can do all of your filtering at that level. It's just one way to do things. Does it make sense to mix HTMX and React? People mix HTMX and React. I've seen it. I've seen it done. Um, in fact, the Beth stack, which is that one that I mentioned earlier, is Bun, Elixir, Terso, and HTMX. What they don't say is they're using React as the server-side template engine. So they're still using React, just only on the server. So interesting. We call it a React cocktail. Okay. And then there's one on the client side that did this cool like eventing and stuff like that. Uh, could we get some more examples of projects that would not be favorable for HTMX? Uh, anytime, uh, I mean, you could always shoehorn in some amount of HTMX. You can always argue why you shouldn't use HTMX. Anytime that I, I, I see something that is like highly client uh, interactive, and what I mean by highly client interactive, I don't mean like a bunch of squares on the screen. So if you went to twitter.com, like a lot of this is a bunch of squares on screen, right? Oh, look at that HTMX org guy right there saying something, who knows what he's even saying. But anyways, like a lot of this is a bunch of squares on screen. How much of this needs to be dynamically updated? Well, we have a little notification right here. If you can stream in out of band updates, you kind of already have that thing solved. And so it's like, how much do you need interactivity? If I can drag and drop and move a bunch of stuff around and create really customized views, maybe that part should definitely not be HTMX. You shouldn't try to make that HTMX. It'd be crazy to try to make that HTMX. I don't even think it's possible. You'd want a JavaScript side experience here. And that would make way more sense. Uh, there was a question about how you were getting your autocomplete with HTMX, your LSP. Oh, how was I getting the autocomplete? Uh, made an, I, I made an LSP. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, GitHub, the, sorry, I have it at 4K and I never have it at 4K, HTML, uh, HTMX LSP. It pretty much works. 
a couple people have been contributing to it, it really made it awesome. There's still like a bug or two. Um, it's in cargo, so you can cargo install HTMX LSP, but I don't have it, so it's hooked up with Mason. And I believe there is a VS Code client right here. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how well it, it in integrates with the VS Code client. It might be in the readme somewhere down here. Uh, VS Code, no official support. Emacs, no official support, so there you go. So I'm just kind of, honestly, I'm just waiting for somebody to say, hey, we got it in Mason. And I'll be like, hey, there you go. You can install it now with NeoVim. And then if someone wants to do it for whatever it takes to do in VS Code, go do it. I'll be potentially building an LSP here soon again for work. So I'll probably learn all about the VS Code side. So if it's not done by then, I'll just do it for this. Uh, this is a little related to the React question earlier, but are, do you have any thoughts on a JavaScript framework that is a good match with HTMX in general, like Solid or Svelte? I think I, I don't know how Svelte will do, uh, but I'm sure. I mean, I I would just assume if you're already using a big framework, you should just use the one you know best or the one you want to learn. I I don't think there's a lot of dictation required. You can use Leptos and Rust if you really want to. You can use OCaml and Dream if you want to. Right? You you got a lot of options. There's no. It's not, it's not something that dictates, right? It's something that is trying to be like the opposite of it. It's having as little opinions about how you do anything as possible. Is there a way to preserve state without a form submission? The example I'm thinking is a tabbed view with multiple steps. I want the user to be able to go through the wizard and then have the previous steps data persist when they go to the next tab or another component but not submit anything until the final step is finished. Yeah, you're gonna need to have a bit of JavaScript for that one. Like that's gonna have to be some level of JavaScript going on. Uh, I've never tried to build that one in HTML, so I don't, I don't know how, how much that is, but to me that sounds like, yeah, you're kind of breaking into potentially, I mean, the problem about that, the, the problem about that entire thing is that you, it's hard to represent that state as a URL. Uh, you have this whole problem where you're, you're really representing a single piece of content into three separate windows or four separate windows or however many are in the signup wizard. And so that, that's, a, that's, that's difficult. You can use cookies, you could use local storage, you could do a bunch of stuff to be able to recall from wherever. Uh, so is it impossible? Absolutely not. Is it hard? Probably not. I just have never tried, so I don't, I've never tried to do it with local storage or cookies, so. Sure you can though. Probably do something with like hidden input fields, like a fake form kind of thing. Say that again? Like hidden input fields. Like you can have a form on the page with a bunch of hidden input fields to kind of keep state. Yeah, yeah, you could do a hit, yeah. Input fields would be really easy to kind of make that happen. Is there a reason you weren't using uh, BEM syntax in your CSS? Using which syntax? BEM. I don't know what BEM is. That's that block object modifier. It's a. Uh... I think someone's trolling. I don't do CSS, okay? So we've already talked about this. I call it a Google first language. Uh, well, now I guess it's a chat Gibbity first language, but you know, or a V0 first language, okay? Don't, 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 don't test me on that, okay? I don't know them. I, I, did a, I, did a, I did a flex list without looking it up, and I did it in both two different directions. I already feel like I'm 95% way there. Appreciate this time. It was fantastic. Have a good one.